Phantom fans, and welcome into another episode of Ghost Stories presented by our friends at Duncan. I'm Voice of the Phantom's Matt Lipsack, reminding you that Ghost Stories not only is available on YouTube, but is also available on many popular podcatchers such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Podcasts, and many others. So be sure to subscribe and leave us a review today. Joining me on the show is a member of the Michigan State Spartans, the first defenseman to be named team captain in Phantoms history, 35 points in 83 USHL games, a member of the Phantoms all-decade team from Rochester Hills, Michigan, Aiden Gallagher. Aiden, welcome to the show. Go green, my man. Go white. Pleasure to be here. Aiden, why Michigan State? Uh, well... I mean, it's a pretty, pretty simple answer. Uh, kid from Rochester Hills, Michigan, hour and a half from campus. Um, grew up going to the GLI, Joe Louis Arena, watching uh, that big tournament with my, my dad. He was a huge Spartan fan growing up. Uh, he had opportunity to play soccer here. Uh, came to the first orientation date and went to go to trade school after that. So uh, he was always a big Sparty fan growing up. So our house is green and white. Uh, so when the offer came and had the opportunity to come here, it was, it was a no brainer. What, what are you studying there in East Lansing? I'm studying environmental science. Okay. Very nice. Uh, one year of classes under your belt, favorite and least favorite class so far. Okay. So honestly, it might, I'm taking two summer classes right now. Okay. And, and one's my favorite. One's my least favorite. I got physical geography, which I really like. Um, you know, with all, all the seasons, I'm, I'm really big into climbing. I like the outdoors, the woods, the water. So I like uh, learning about all that kind of stuff. And least favorite is uh, stats. Like I was telling you before getting on this, on my modules and lessons that I was doing, it's a lot of stats work. And uh, with these summer classes, everything's expedited and quicker. So we're really moving fast. And it's been a lot of work, but we're getting through it. I, I was talking to Mike Regish on our last episode and, and he and I both agree. Well, we disagreed because he's a business major. So math, me, uh-uh, nope, nope. Not a math guy? No, not a math guy. I'm a communications guy. Come on. You know how many math classes I took at, at YSU? I, I, I couldn't, two? Two. Two? Sur- survey of math and then uh, media markets and statistics. Oh, That's anything it. with statistics, not a fan of. I, no. I, I don't mind math. I uh, actually tend to do better in those classes, but stats is a different breed. But uh, the algebra, calculus, like I, I don't mind that kind of stuff. Ge- um, geometry. Okay. So you're playing for the Michigan State Spartans. Just this past season, former Phantom captain Tommy Apap graduated. And any okay. Tommy Apap stories you can share? Um. Well, I guess there was one, I think we were playing Penn State and he blocked a shot off the foot and I didn't notice he left the game, but he left the game, came back out, uh, probably took some painkillers, but after the game took his, took his skate off and it, I can't even describe how swollen it was and how big it was. And that was the Friday night game. So we had Saturday night to play too. And Next day, we have morning skate. You can barely skate on it, but he's like, uh, I don't know what shots we have. Like, they give us a shot, and it, like, numbs the body or whatnot. And so give me one of those, I'll play. He's playing on almost broken foot. Like, they got x-rays. It was, like, severely bruised, like, very, very bad. Could barely, barely put his uh, his boot on. I think they had to get, like, adjust his skate to, to make his foot fit. And it was swollen for maybe a month, month and a half. It was it was very very bad, but just the fact that he's like I'm, it's like I'm not sitting out. It's like did all the workouts, did everything with just a balloon of a foot. Uh, that was that was pretty crazy. But uh, other than that, like all with the whole COVID year, it was uh, it was a pretty 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 mellow year. Like I I have no experience with college life and what normality is, but. Um, it seemed pretty calm, like, uh, it'd just be the guys hanging out with each other. So, uh, funny or exciting Tommy Apap stories off the ice. Don't, don't have a lot of those, but we, we shared a lot of, uh, good memories. We both built it at the Herchick. So, uh, we were talking about life there and, uh, just jokes about that. We would, uh, 
FaceTime them occasionally. I, I know we had a, a golf outing before the season started in uh, early August, late July. And uh, we were out in the course and we're just like, let's give them a FaceTime call and just FaceTime them and put them on the spot. Who is your favorite billet? And uh, I could answer it. I, I don't know. It's a toss up. But uh, yeah, that was that was fun. It's nice going into uh, uh, your, a new team, knowing someone having that connection kind of early, uh, especially with him being a, a two two year captain. Um, he was very respected throughout the team on the ice, off the ice and a uh, very stand up guy. And he was a really, really good guy to look up to just a workhorse. So big fan of Tommy. You mentioned, you know, just going through this past season with the pandemic and everything. What was the, the season like for you just trying to keep the team on the ice with everything that was going on in the world? It was very difficult. So over the summer when we all got to campus, it was a mandatory two week quarantine. And uh, like I said, a freshman coming in, we had a freshman class of eight. We didn't know what normality was here. And I guess over the summer, the guys would hang out with each other. Coaches would have the guys over for barbecues and stuff at their house, a lot of team bonding. And we really had none of that coming into um, into the year. But when we got to campus, I think we were on a two week, uh, a week long quarantine. Everybody couldn't leave the house. We were in the dorms, the freshmen uh, couldn't leave the dorms. We had to get uh, PCR tests once a week, the, the big deep nose one. Not a fan of those, we didn't like them. Uh, so we had those going for about two months and then we switched to a nose swab, which was a lot easier, a lot quicker results. Um, that turned into an everyday thing, 7 a.m., get up, go to uh, the Smith Center, which is where uh, the study hall is and all of our tutors are. We go there, test, um, but it was masks everywhere, in the rink, out of the rink. We would have to walk to our uh, weight room and to use the band field and we have to work out with our masks on, outside, inside. Everywhere was wearing a mask, everywhere was closed. And then I think late September, uh, about 20 guys came down with COVID. And oh, yeah, it was just really quick. Our season started in November, where like the first part of our season started. So uh, end of September, after two and a half, three months of training, getting ready for the season, um, about 20 guys, including myself, all came down with COVID. And it was isolation for 10 days. And then after those 10 days were up, you had to get a, another test, a nose swab and then a PCR test. And then uh, once those came back negative, then you had to go get an echo done. And uh, it was like two more tests to make sure that there was no defects with the heart or lungs before you can get integrated back into uh, playing, which that was another four day process. So in, in total, you're out for three weeks. And we came back middle of October, had to reacclimate to the training, get back into it. It was like starting from zero and uh, getting into the season. Um, I don't want to say a step back because we're not going to use excuses, but uh, definitely had to get back into the swing of things. And then throughout the uh, season, um, usually they would uh, charter, charter flights to all the games, but we had to bus everywhere, which is no different from junior hockey. Uh -huh. But same thing at other campuses, it was wake up, go to the rink to test or wherever they had their testing at. It was masks in the rink, mask while warming up, mask in the hotel. Uh, couldn't go out to eat. We had everything uh, delivered to the hotel, all the food, all the meals. Um, it was just really, it was, it was a big lockdown. Um, not as much freedom as you would normally have. Uh, it was, it was, it was very weird. Um, but the whole mass situation was just, I don't know. It was a lot. It was some guys disagree with it because at the rink, you're all wearing masks, but when you're in the locker room, you don't have to wear masks. And it's just like, <laughs> we're all together. Uh, I don't know. It was a big safety protocol. I understand where they're coming from, but, um, it was kind of hard to wrap our heads around, especially for the entire year of, of doing it. But, uh, thankfully, once the vaccinations came out, uh, a big majority of the guys got vaccinated. So we don't have to wear the mask anymore. Michigan is now no more mandates. Everything's 100% open. So I'm hoping to get a more normal, normalish year. It was, uh, I think, another, another uh, 
major difference was no fans in the rink. They would filter mm-hmm. in uh, fake fake fan noise over the speakers while we were playing. Uh, you could buy cardboard cutouts, so there wasn't fans in the seats, but there was. Uh, you can get cardboard cutouts of anything you wanted. So there was cardboard cutouts of dogs, of horses, just a, a, a bunch of a bunch of stuff, and it, it made the rink look bigger but it was just weird you get a stoppage and play you're going to a face off you look up and you see a horse in the stands you're like this is not right <laughs> but yeah so you were in youngstown when when the pandemic took hold you know we're getting ready to play dubuque the dubuque comes in for practice on a thursday night and turn it around boys we're we're shutting things down what was you know the rest of that year and, and then that that summer for you i mean georgie merkulov came and stayed at your house all summer didn't he Oh yeah, so that was uh, funny how that turned out. Um, yeah, I still remember that day. We watched the Butte play, and um, a bunch of the guys were in the trainer's room talking with talking with Joe, like whole coronavirus, COVID nineteen. What is it? It was in China. Now it's over here. Oh, it's another disease, and joking around with it. And uh, yeah, Joe was like, uh, "Season might get canceled," and we're like, "What? Like, no, it's not going to happen. I could cancel a season because this disease and." go out to watch uh, Dubuque practice and they're all at center ice. They just got in the ice and they're getting off. Like, what's going on? And they're like, we're not playing. We have to go back to Dubuque. And they're out there for, I think it was morning skate, either morning skate or the, the, the day before. It might've been a Thursday. Uh-huh. And um, like, no, this isn't right. So and, uh, Patty brought us into the locker room. They're like, this weekend's games are canceled. We're not sure what's, what's going to happen moving forward. And uh, you're with the 25 guys who, like you've trained in the whole year, like you have one goal to win a Clark Cup and make make a run. Some guys, it's their draft year. They're trying to put on a good season so they can get drafted and, you know, uh, their future, trying to set, set their future up. And um, like we're in the locker room, you know how it happens junior hockey. Every year, any team, any, any, every year the team changes. You're never with the same group of guys. And we're in the locker room joking around, uh, weekend break, come back Monday, let's get back after it. Uh, so I was going to go home that weekend and I was going to bring Yusaku Ando and, uh, Merkulov back with me just to hang out. They had nowhere to stay. So we go back Sunday hits and Brad Patterson texts the group and there's like seasons canceled. And, uh, that kind of, it didn't sink, sink in very quickly that you're like, you're not going to see that team ever again. Like some of the guys didn't get to say bye to um because everyone who went home was coming back at different times and um it was it was kind of tough like we had one night out that night on Thursday where it was like okay guys see you back on Monday like we'll see you at practice be ready to skate and that never happened like you you leave uh you leave that house and you didn't realize it's the last time you're gonna see those guys and uh once you found the season was canceled it was kind of like it was it was saddening you're just like you worked so hard during that season. To, uh, I mean, it was my last season of junior hockey and you want to make a run for it or make a good push for the organization, for your team. Um, and it was just cut short, but um, <clears throat> that ensuing summer, I had uh, Ando also stay with me for about two weeks until he went back to Japan. So him, Merkulov and I, uh, we found a, uh, a gym that we went to and we worked out until we knew I'd go back. We brought him back to Youngstown. And, uh, he flew out and then uh, Merkulov and I came back to Michigan. And uh, yeah, we, we trained, we skated with uh, Perusi. Oh, we got some story. We got some Merkulov stories that are just popping into my head. <laughs> um, so we'll go on. I, I think, I think George would probably be angry with you. Watch yourself. Oh, he won't be angry with me. He will not be angry with me. He'll actually, he he'll he'll laugh at this as well if he if he listens to this. But okay. uh, so Merkulov and I kind of had a, a a set schedule. We would work out throughout the week. We'd do some conditioning. We'd skate Tuesday Wednesday or Tuesday Thursdays. And uh, uh, Nick Peruzzi lives about a mile and a half from me, two miles. Okay. He was telling us how he wanted to like get us on the ice, work out with us, all that jazz, and. Uh, it was a Saturday, Saturday morning, like 10 a.m. Like Merck and I just had a week of training. We're like, Saturdays are off day. 
and it's like it's raining out it's kind of ugly out 50 degrees or something like that and I get a call from uh from Nikki and he goes uh, what are you guys doing right now and I got a bowl of cereal on the couch watching tv Merck's Merck's eating breakfast we're like oh like we just got up like uh watching tv he goes what are you guys doing today and we're like nothing it's like our off day he goes let's go for a run and we're like okay where are we running to and I'm not sure for uh all the all the listeners out there don't know the geography of Michigan. Um, we live in Rochester Hills, and when I asked him where we're running to, he goes, "We're gonna run to Oxford, which was nine miles away." And I'm like, "Nikki, I was like, what are you talking about?" I was like, "Who's gonna drive us back from Oxford?" He goes, "We're gonna run there, and then we're gonna run back." And I like. I have this on speakerphone and Merck's giving me his little Russian look. He's just like, what? He's like, what's he talking about? <laughs> Merck's like, how far is that? I'm like, Merck, that's an 18 mile run. And he goes, no. He's like, we no run. And Cruz, he's like, ah, you know, like there's, there's guys who are sitting at home doing nothing right now. Like, wouldn't you want to be out there getting better when guys are sitting home watching TV zero on the couch? He's like, that's what we're doing right now. He goes, because then, then be, be different. And we're like, you can't say no to a coach, especially when he's just trying to make you better. So we're like, okay, let's, let's go. So we meet in downtown Rochester, and uh, um, he brings a backpack. Uh, Nikki, he brings a backpack and uh, put water, snacks in the backpack. And uh, thinking to myself, I'm like, he's going to carry this the entire run? And I'm already like, adrenaline's running. Like, I don't run. I just don't, don't run, don't do distance. Merck does not run. Like, Nicky's a pretty, he's, he's in shape. He's, he runs a lot. He, like, he's, he's trained for this. And um, before we start running, he goes, got this backpack. It was like five, 10 pounds. And he goes, every mile I'm going to switch off who carries it. I'm like, no way. I was like, seriously, this is what's going to happen. So I'm just, I'm like, oh no. So we start running. We're at like a, I don't know, like a nine minute pace and we're going, we're going. I'm not even like looking at the distance, not looking at the time. I'm just trying to get through step by step. Uh-huh. And uh, the entire time, I'm going to get four miles. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. He goes, the only thing that he said the entire run was mind over matter, mind over matter. It's drizzling out. It's, it's cold. I got some, I got some thermal leggings on, some running shorts, and like a sweatshirt because it was, it was kind of cold out there. And um, we ended up making it to Oxford. And uh, Peruzzi's like, just it's like stretch it out, guys. That kind of stuff. And I'm over there sitting next, like standing next to Merck. I'm like, no way we run back. There's not a chance like we're making it back. No way. Like we're waiting for Peruzzi to call a ride, like thinking that he like eyes were bigger than than his stomach with his running and uh-huh it's five minutes we're turning around going back i called my mom i was like mom i'm running back now like freak out like i can't do it <laughs> i can't feel them so we start running back and i think we hit i hit like the 13 mile mark 13 and a half mile mark and i'm like i can't do it anymore can't do it i tapped out i was like can't do it i was next to my friend's house i I called him up. I was like, can you pick me up? I need a ride back to Rochester. So Nikki's like, we'll meet you back in Rochester. I'm like, okay. So we get back to Rochester and my friend's like, drops you off my car. And before, before he leaves, I'm like, my keys are in the backpack. I'm like, no way. <laughs> keys are in the backpack. I was like, we got to wait. So we're waiting there and we made it to Oxford and two i don't know hour and a half maybe and we we had a we had a pretty good pace i forgot okay. what the time was but i just remember waiting in the car and it was like an hour past i'm like they're still not back i'm like what's going on so i call up i text i text nikki i'm like where are you guys at and he gives me a call and he goes we need a ride I'm like what do you mean he goes Merck can't walk anymore and i'm like no way it's like, where are you guys at? And they give me the location. And they, they literally went maybe a mile and a half, two miles in an hour we were waiting for them. So we pull into the, to the spot close to where they're at, a parking spot. And all I see is Merck's arms around Nikki as he's like carrying him back to the car. And 
we get we get in the car it's all silent and Merck goes never again I'll never run again and we're just like Nikki why'd you make us do that that's awful and we get back to um Merck and I ended up getting back to my house walk in and mom's like how far did you guys run like 13 miles and she's like what get in the shower just did not get out for like 20 minutes just I was just sitting in the shower just in pain the legs were just gone for the next I don't know 10 days just it was bad we couldn't walk the next day and that was that was just a joke in itself but I mean it was it was funny I, um Nikki Nikki sent me a screenshot of our of our route um a couple months ago he goes never forget what you did and it was I mean, we were proud of 13 miles off of literally no training at all running a half marathon um it was definitely something I wouldn't recommend doing again. Bet, yeah. Better you than me, bud. Oh, it was, I, would, I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. That was, that was very, very bad. But yeah, that was, that was one of the stories. Like, you know, when Merck was back, we taught him how to golf. Um, I really live on a, our, our house backs up to a golf course back in Michigan. And um, our whole family would work. Like I, I was a butcher. My sister worked at a bakery. My mom worked and my dad worked as well. So Merck was usually home alone and, um, my buddy gave him a set of clubs because he was a lefty. I'm a righty. Uh-huh. We just come back and works out in the golf course, golf and that kind of stuff. Having a time like he knew is way partially around the city. Like to go for bike rides. He knew the parks he went to to work out, where to run. Um, but one day I was working, and I got off at five o'clock, and I get back home. My dad's home. My sister wasn't off yet. My mom wasn't off yet. So I get home, ask my dad, I'm like, where's Merck at? He's like, oh, I don't know. I haven't seen him yet. Okay. So I just go about my day. My mom gets home. My sister gets home. We sit down to have dinner, like nine o'clock now. We're eating dinner. And the uh, question comes up, like, where's, uh, where's Merck at? My dad's like, I thought you knew where he was at. I'm like, I thought my mom knew where he was at. My sister's like, I don't know where he's at. And we're like, where's Merck at? It's like 9.30 now. It's like, it's dark. It gets, it's dark okay. out. Check the house. Nobody. Check the golf course. Wasn't on the golf course. Kind of freaking out now. And then we see that there's a bike missing from our garage. And we're like, oh, no, he took a bike out. And my dad's mind goes to, Merck would do like 40-mile bike rides with my dad. And um, so my dad's mind immediately goes to, he like because Merck can ride for a long time and my dad's uh-huh. like he's out in the street biking right now like he's not back yet he has like no reflectors nothing he's in a city that he does not know like he could be very far away so immediately rescue mission my dad goes to the police station I call all my friends my sister calls all her friends we're all driving around the city my mom's driving around we go to like the parks that we would go to like the, the trails in the woods like we're running around all like all through there like 10 30 rolls around and we're like on a all out mission, like a search party uh-huh. throughout Rochester, like the neighboring cities. And um, I get a text from Peruzzi and he's like, what time do you want Merck home? <laughs> and I, I immediately called him. I'm like, I'm like, is Merck at your house? And he's like, yeah, did he not tell you? I'm like, no, like we have a search party out for him right now. Like the cops are looking for him. Like, family and friends are all looking for him we're all driving around he goes no he's in my house all day so i just drive over to Bruzy's house just furious and i pull in Merck's in the driveway get out of the car he goes hey galley and i just unleash i'm like Merck, like, what are you doing like we're all looking for you right now <clears throat> just chew him apart like i i kind of snapped him a little bit mm-hmm. after my whole rant <clears throat> the only thing this guy says is i didn't know you guys cared about me and I'm, I'm like, Merck, like, we're all, like, looking for you. Like, you, did, you didn't leave a note. You didn't do anything. Didn't tell us where you're at. Like, we thought, like, you were biking, like, you are gone. And he's like, uh, he goes, no, I hang out with Peruzzi. And, it, like, he had a whole day with him. They went bowling, watched a movie, had dinner. Like, I kind of stopped. And we just had no clue where he was at. Got home. My parents yelled at him. And he was just, because just, he didn't have a phone either. Like, he didn't have a phone. Okay. Like, he had nothing. We had no way to contact him. No way. Like, did not know where he was at. And, after that, he was more diligent about letting us know where he was at. But before that, it was, oh, we were, we were in a, a panic. We lost the Russian in Rochester. And 
<laughs> we're like, how are we going to explain this to Patty? How are we going to explain this to Andrew, like his parents? Like, we're just worst case scenario. We got to rush on the side of the road. Like, he doesn't know his directions. But I think that was the craziest, one of the craziest stories about him. <clears throat> um, I think the last Merck story that comes to mind was his last day. Okay. Um, we would typically run at two parks. Uh, one was like a man-made lake and one was uh, like we'd do these stairs in the woods that were like really steep, a lot of stairs. And uh, so the night before I get off work, come back and he goes, it's like, Gally, I have a surprise for you. And I'm like, what is it? He goes, tomorrow I take you. Okay, sounds good. What does it involve? He goes, I can't tell you, surprise. Okay. Sounds good. So I wake up the next morning. He goes, let's go. Okay. He goes, where are we going? He goes, I'll tell you. Okay. We're walking out the house. He goes, do you have a knife? And I'm like, Merck, what's going on here? He goes, bring a knife. He's like laughing his little mischievous laugh. You know, Merck and his laugh. And yep. I'm like, okay, bring the knife. And um, so we're driving and he's like, tell me the direction that we end up at the middle school. I'm like, Merck, what's going on? <laughs> We have a knife in the middle square now. This is like this is frowned upon. That's not good. That's not good. It's not good. So he's just laughing. He's not telling me anything. So he goes, "Follow me." So we go back into the woods through these trails. I'm like, "Murk, you got to know what's going on." Like we're going to like to one of the parks that we'd run at, which is like a public park with like kids, families, like all swimming. It's a beach there. Uh-huh. Like Merck, you're openly carrying a knife right now. I was like, you know, his typical Russian. He's like. That's not the way a friendly guy, like, with his face. You know, he's a nice guy, but he just doesn't look friendly. He's an intimidating person. This is true. This is true. It's all true. And, um, I mean, it turns out all he wanted to do is carve his name into a tree. And I was like, Merck. I was like, this isn't a surprise. You could have said that you want to carve your name into a tree. Like, this is, the surprise was, I thought, I didn't know what you were doing with a knife at the middle school. That was the surprise. But we ended up going to both parks to carve his name. And uh, he carved his name into the wooden stairs. And he carved his name into uh, the pull-up bar that he'd do pull-ups at the one park. But I was just, I was on edge. I was like, what's, what's this kid going to do? I was like, I'm, I'm going to claim I don't know him pretty soon. But, um, yeah, I drove him back to Youngstown that day. And uh, I still keep in contact with him. He's playing at Ohio State next year. So um, I'll call him every so often, joke around with him about playing him for the next couple of years and that uh-huh. kind of stuff. And, but yeah, that was, that was fun. Great training part. And we pushed each other a lot. When one person would want to work out, their guy would make him work out. It was, it was a pleasure to have him. And uh, he knows he's always welcome back in my house. He's, it's like, uh, he's, he's like another family member, like the whole family loves him. So. So you, you mentioned Georgie is going to play at Ohio state, obviously big rival of Michigan state. Then there's also that school in Ann Arbor. So who makes your blood boil more? Hands down, Michigan. Okay. And, yeah, no questions asked there. All right, that, that's fair. Just, you know, wanted to let the people know who, what, what color do we have to wear to make Alan, Aiden Gallagher angry? Oh, maize and blue. I don't like those guys one bit. Okay, that, that's fair. You, you get, you'd get along well with my wife. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Uh, friends, you are listening and watching uh, Ghost Stories, the Youngstown Fans official podcast, which is presented by our friends at Duncan. We are available on YouTube and many popular podcatchers such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, and many, many more. So uh, NHL draft just happened. Any, anybody you know get picked? Uh, there was a lot of people who I know, not personally, but... Like you said, the maize and blue, they had four of the five. No. <laughs> nah, not about it. Not, not about, about the maize and blue. No, but um, other than that, like you have the, a lot of the program kids, like you just, you play against them, so you know who they are, but um, no one personal who I can just text up and, hey, congrats, man, but a lot of familiar names. Jake Gingell, you're still our guy, but uh, the rest of the rest of the maize and blue, no? Yeah, not a, not a fan. <laughs> Aiden, you you were named to the All Decade team for the Phantoms. What does it mean to you that you were chosen as one of the the top defensemen in the first ten years of Phantoms history? Uh, I mean, it was uh, it was a huge honor. Um, I'm not sure what the process was into into choosing that team, but um, I mean, it was it was it was very humbling. Like, there was a lot of a lot of top names up there. 
uh, uh, honored to be part of that list with, with those guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what, what much more to say about, about that fact. Uh, uh, just happy being a part of it. And um, I know it means a lot, like obviously to be part of uh, an all decade team for a USHL team. Uh, to me, uh, it, just, it, it kind of felt like I was doing, going in the right direction and uh, it was positive and taking away from that, just to keep, keep working, so. Uh, you were a member of the Phantoms for two years. Any favorite memories of your, your time in Youngstown? Oh, there's, uh, there's a few. I think the first, the first one that comes to mind was uh, my first year. Uh, we were coming back from a road trip and this is when I lived with the Hurt Chicks with Connor McEachern and Liam Robertson. And okay. we, were, we were really close neighbors with the Raps who had been shown at that time, Matt Barnaby and uh, Yepi Europe. Okay. So we were coming back from a road trip. Barnsey is not the, uh, not the most uh, responsible one. They took his car. And you get off these road trips, it's two in the morning, three in the morning, whatnot. And uh, driving back to the house, kind of go through a little bit of farmland, long stretches of road. And I stayed later to probably help unpack rookie duties, that kind of stuff. And Cax, Robbie and I left a little later and we're going down the main road to get to our house. It was New Buffalo. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that road or not, but it's just a long road, uphill, downhill. And as we're driving, we see this car in the middle of the road with its hazards on. And we're like, oh no, what's this? So come up, come to a stop. And we see, we see Barnsey, Shoner, and Yepi Europe pushing the car, ran out of gas. And <laughs> they're still maybe a mile and a half out from their house. Oh no. So Kex, Robbie, Yepi, and uh, Barnes were pushing the car while Shona was steering it. And I was, I was in my car playing Eye of the Tiger, cheering them on, just, <laughs> just watching them, watching them push the cars, just, just laughing at how irresponsible it was for Barnes. He just passing four or five gas stations on the way home and just, nah, I'm not going to stop. <laughs> I just have to put gas and end up having to push the car back. Luckily, we got it up a hill and it was downhill from there. They literally just got in the car and rode it out downhill. But that was that was a really, really funny, uh, funny, funny memory. And uh, I think another one was uh, my last year there. We had media day at YSU. That was at seven thirty in the morning. Okay. And it was with Dobe, Jensen, and Kuntar. And the night before, we got back from Lincoln. That was a bus ride back, um, 12 hours, I think. Okay. And we got back late. And I set my alarm, going to bed. And I wake up to a phone call from uh, one of the front office um, members. Where you at? Where you at? Check the time, 7.20. Uh, media day starts at 7.30. Uh-huh. I'm in, where is that, Boardman. I was in Boardman by uh, 224, right where the uh, handles is at. Okay. So that's like, I want to say, 15-minute drive. To Easily. Wyatt. Easily. Yeah. Plus, you got to park, then you got to walk. Oh, yeah. So I jump out of bed. I throw khakis on semi-decent shirt and I'm just like I'll be there I'm on my way right now I'm coming coming I'm freaking out I'm like oh no I didn't know what media day was I thought it, like we were just gonna be at like a tent just like saying hi to people as they walk by handing out promos just guys mm -hmm. like stuff so part of me was like okay I'm probably chilling and the other part was like I'm late like I hate being late for things like if you're not early you're late if you're on to or uh if you're not on, if you're on time you're late if you're early you're on time right and I'm just freaking out get in my car get down there as quick as I can talking to them. Like, where do I park? Where do I park? They're like, park in the parking structure. We'll meet you. We'll walk you over to the auditorium. Like auditorium. Like what's going on? 
They're like, well, the students are asking you guys questions. And I'm like, oh no. I was like, this is bad. So it's like 7.45, getting out of the parking garage, meet up with the front office people that take me to the auditorium, hand me the jersey. And as we're walking in, they're just like, walk up quietly, like hopefully no one notices you. I'm like, what's going on? I walk in, it's the whole auditorium filled with, filled with students. And on stage is a table with four seats. One of our two of them's missing because Jensen was also late. So it was Dobe and Kutar up there. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so I try to quietly get on stage and quietly get up, take a seat, face is red, just embarrassed. I'm still like half awake, like didn't get much sleep the night before. Uh -huh. And what's going through my head is I hope no one asks me a question. I was like, no one asked me a question. Next person, they get up there. This one guy, he goes, uh, I got a question for uh, Gallagher. I'm like, no way. <laughs> oh, I'm like right out of the gate. I'm like, yeah, what's up? He goes, why were you late? And I'm like, no. I'm like, that's my answer. That's my first answer. And the first question that I receive is, why are you late in front of a bunch of college kids? And I was like, I was like slept through my alarm. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you to say? Like I slept through my alarm. I was like everyone does it, but I was just so embarrassed. And I think there was like two more questions, and it was over. And I'm like, wow, I just shouldn't even have showed up. <laughs> now I, I was, that was just wow. But that was uh, that was quite the experience. Um, yeah, very embarrassing moment. I bet. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, there's, I mean, pretty much junior hockey life is uh not not overly exciting uh -huh. obviously like uh it's it's tough to get out and and try and do a bunch of stuff because a like we don't really have a lot of money like not a guys not a lot of guys have jobs or disposable income uh -huh. so, kind of saying it out we went to a few concerts we went to uh keith urban which was really fun that was the first year with uh kex robbie dennison and a couple other guys. And I remember leaving there, we took one of like the bike taxis through town to get back to our car. Okay. And um, that was fun. We had like five guys in this maybe three person buggy. And this guy is carrying us on his bike. And he's got a speaker going and we're just going through downtown, just ah, uh, like having a time. Uh -huh. Um. But those, those were fun nights. The concert nights were fun because it was rare, very rare that we went out and did stuff, whether it be like the movies or playing uh, disc golf at uh, Boardman Park. Uh -huh. um, we did bowling a lot. That was, that was fun. Uh, but it was, it was very scarce that we went out and did stuff. A lot of guys were into Xbox, PS4. And okay. I never owned a console, so I tried to do other things like maybe go golf or – going to town, walk around. I was a big fan of the, the mall. Okay. Walk around with Youngstown Clothing Company. Um, I think, oh, another story was, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if you knew about this, but uh, okay. I broke my collarbone the first year. I remember, yeah. And I was out for a while. There was one game where it was snowing really heavily outside. And I still had my sling on. And uh, so after the game, I was talking to Joe and I was like, can I go out and skate right now? Kill some time before, like, I don't want to be leaving when there's a bunch of traffic going on outside. It's snowing a lot. It's like, yeah, sure. No problem. So I ended up being out in the ice until about 2 a.m. Because I, I just, I didn't want anyone, like, I don't want to be in the road. Like I, I had one arm and it was snowing really bad. Uh -huh. um, so I get out start driving home. Like I thought it was pretty cool being at the rink so late, just being alone on the ice. Like I haven't skated in a while. So just getting out there for a rip. Um, when I get, I get back out of my car, start driving down. What's the road when you get out of Covella, you turn right, you make another right. Is that South street? South Avenue. Yeah. South Avenue. So I was driving on South Avenue and there's no cars in the road. There is one car. So that's a four, four lane, five lane street. Right. And so I was in the, I want to say going north, away from Covelli towards North, uh, north Lima. Well, you're, you're going south if you're leaving Youngstown and going, to, you're going north Lima. You're going south. Okay. So I was going south and I was in the lane closest to the center. 
and there was a car maybe three or four car lengths ahead of me in the oh. right lane and I'm going 35 40 miles an hour just trying to go slow right and I just passed one of the lights right before the highway uh-huh. and this car just bangs a U-turn. I was saying, no, no, nothing. I got one arm, one hand on the wheel, slam my brakes, try to cut my wheel, hit him. I slide into the other lanes that was like oncoming traffic. Uh-huh. There was like two cars coming at me and I'm like, oh no, 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 no. I was like freaking out. I was like, this is not okay. Uh-huh. Well, I slid through those lanes into a parking lot on the other side of the street. And I just get out and uh, it's the first car accident I've been in. I get uh-huh. out in my, my suit, my sling, and I kind of look at the guy. I'm like, dude, what were you doing? And he's like, oh, I, I, he's like, I didn't know there was other people on the road. You're just going to ping a U-turn like in, in, a, in a blizzard right now? I was like, what's going on? And so like his car was not drivable. So we push his car into a side street. I get my car to a side street and... I was like, where do you live? He's like, Pennsylvania. He's like, I don't know, maybe late 20s. Uh-huh. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I was driving home. I was like, you're driving back to Pennsylvania right now. He goes, yeah. He's like, I can't drive my car now. And I'm like, I, I see that. <laughs> uh, so I end up, like, I was like, I call up the her chicks. I'm like, got in a car accident. No clue what to do. Like had zero clue what to do. Uh huh. Get your insurance, exchange insurance informations. Um, look at his license. I'll get his phone number. Call the police. So I like I tell after I get off the phone, I go out and tell the guy all these steps. He goes, "We don't gotta get the police involved." I'm like, what do you mean? So we don't gotta tell the police. And I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. Like my car is like pretty messed up right now. And I was like, he's like, I'll like I'll cover it. I'm like, how are you gonna do that? Because my my insurance will cover it. And I'm like, uh, let me see your insurance. And he goes, I don't want to get the police involved because my insurance is expired. <laughs> and I'm like, Dude, <laughs> what's going on? I'm like, how are you to get back to Pennsylvania? He's like, I don't know. And um, so we ended up calling a, a tow truck. And I think, I can't remember clearly, he may have either Ubered from Youngstown back to Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. Or he stayed at the mechanical shop where the tow truck came and picked him up. <laughs> but either way, that's, a, that's just not a, not, a, not a good bounce for that guy. And, no, uh, no, 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 no. But I ended up uh, getting all the damages paid for, which is really nice because I already had a dent in the – I got hit in the front right fender, and I already had a dent there, so I got a whole new front right, front right fender, which is really nice. But, I mean, first experience getting a car accident, I already had a broken collarbone. <laughs> I just, this is just this is not what Joe would want right now. Our, our no. chance, so yeah. But um, it was it was definitely exciting. It was it was an experience to be had. Um, but yeah. You you were named the the captain of the the nineteen twenty team. What what did that mean to you? And for those of us on on the outside, is that a, a player vote or is that something that the the coaches award? Uh, so first off, it was, it was a huge honor. Um, I know, I know personally, I'm not, I'm not one to uh, kind of read, read the room or, or like how I'm perceived as a player. Like I, I like to kind of keep my head down and just do my own thing and try to be a, a good teammate when I can. Um, so I, I really had, I had no idea what was going on. We were in Lincoln earlier that year and uh, Patty got all the guys in a room and they're like, we're going to, um, we're gonna get two guys to, to wear a letter tonight. Um, put down four guys that you think could wear a letter. And uh, that night he said it was uh, Kuntar and I had letters in our jersey, which uh, first off, Kuntar's great guy. I have nothing, nothing bad to say about him. A bunch of positive workhorse. Uh, his work ethic is second to none. His, his energy in the locker room, his presence, his vocal. Like he's a very vocal leader and he leads by example as well. I, him and I are still really close. Talk to him every day. Don't forget the fashion sense. <sighs> pink shirts. That kid can wear a pink shirt. 
If he has a pink shirt on, he's having a good day. That's, that's, that's a, this is a fact. This is a scientific proven fact. Yes, it's been proven multiple times. Um, but yes, we had we had that uh, that night. We both got our letters in our jersey. We had the A, and um, that was in November. And then we played USA in mid January, and um, it was after the Tri City weekends. We had Tri City on a Friday, Saturday, and then that Monday. Or I apologize. That was the six five overtime win against USA. Okay. Which was hands down my favorite win in Youngstown colors, maybe ever being down. I think it was five five two, five one going into the third. Five two sounds right. Five two going into the third, come back to win six five. That was electric. It was the boys were going. It was a it was a, a lot of positive energy. I I've never been so excited or happy after a win after beating those guys we don't like them very much but um <laughs> yeah that that monday um i'm not sure i think it might have been a, a coach's call but that monday he kind of just addressed he's um and named myself captain and uh gave letters to jensen and uh felker as well so they wore a's but um i it kind of caught me blindly um obviously i'm i'm very honored to to have been chosen uh, for that position and um, honored to uh, have that responsibility and uh, kind of lead in that example. Um, if it was my decision, though, I would have gave it to Kuntar. <laughs> um, very deserving kid, workhorse, brought it every day. I thought it was a toss up. I could, it could have gone either way at that at that point, but. Uh, I was I was kind of shocked when he when he said that like I, when he was naming a captain I, I was ready for him to say Trevor Kuntar and um, I was a bit taken back but uh, obviously I was very excited to call my parents right after um, and it, it was it was an honor to to wear the C for a month and a half before COVID hit and uh, yeah I, I enjoyed it very much uh, and happy that uh, my teammates felt that way. To, to vote me to have a letter and um yeah i was thankful for that well aiden we're getting ready to wrap up what are your plans for the the rest of the summer finishing up some some classes oh yeah so we got the classes that i'm doing right now after after this call i gotta do some quizzes and write a paper and try to go fishing before the sun goes down okay um, but right now the whole team's up here we got 8 a.m workouts and skates after oh boy and then um, I'm currently working at a restaurant as a server. Okay. I got that going. We got workouts, school, and then work. And it's been a grind. Um, but it's nice to have a little disposable income during the season. And it definitely makes myself more productive. So I'm not sitting around watching Netflix or putting my thumbs at something to do. But just getting prepared for this season and uh, ready to beat Merkulov and beat Shoner. So... So we're preparing for it. You're up for, uh, for a good season. Aiden Gallagher of the Michigan State Spartans, thanks for joining us here on Ghost Stories. Thank you for having me. Well, Phantom fans, be sure to tune in for our next episode. And a reminder that Ghost Stories is presented by our friends over at Duncan. I'm Voice of the Phantoms, Matt Lipsack. Sound out. Fade to black.